don't know where I stand in relation to the peculiar power. That's why I keep writing books. Uh, sometimes I, th I think I am it. I am, you know, Dostoevsky said, uh, everybody in the world is saved but me. And he was very proud of this, um, in some moods. And sometimes that's what I think. Sometimes I, um, sometimes I think it's, it's um, a period in the universe and the planet's tipping too much or some kind of thing like that. It, it is tr true that everybody these days, however happy his life and however isolated he is from, from the big city troubles and, or whatever, is, has to be aware that, that kind of terrible moments are, are just out there at the edge. In my own mind, I, when, I, when I write a novel, I'm working on particular problems, not really philosophical problems, although they have sort of philosophical implications, but mainly um, problems in my own attitudes toward things. There's a sort of basic thing in me, which is, I'm, I'm one of those people of faith, you know, I believe um, that tomorrow's going to come and that the world is not going to destroy itself uh, by, with the atomic bomb or anything else. Um, and on the other hand, well, I don't know. I, I've did warring things. Every, everybody does, and every writer makes his plots out of them, I guess. On one hand, I, I'm a real law and order type. You know, I think everybody should be good, you know. And on the other hand, I want to blow up the universe. And uh, what you do is you just split these two parts into two nice cartoon characters and, and let them fight it out. And the law and order part always works because people who want to blow up the universe always end up blowing up themselves. But that isn't really a good argument against it. It's just a, you know, a statement. So everything I've done deals with that in a general kind of way. But each novel takes a different kind of aspect of that basic thing, I think. At least in my mind it does. I was very much interested in sunlight dialogues and sort of social things and the, the, the alleged breakdown of you know American civilization and so on. In Grendel, I was interested in a completely different thing, which is uh, the implications of, of Jean-Paul Sartre's philosophy and the people who followed him down to Marcuse and so on, and the people who went behind him. A philosophy which is, uh, which is, I think, essentially paranoid and, uh, and loveless and faithless and, and egoistic and other nasty things, all of which are very attractive to me, um, although I'm also on the other side. And so when I was doing Grendel, I wanted to apply in a modern setting the sort of basic things about that poem. And uh, one of the basic things in that, well, the essence of that poem, it's about the tripartite soul and, and about the breakdown of reason and, and the man's desperate attempt to hang on to reason against what in the Middle Ages would be treated as very simple um, irascibility and, and concupiscence in the platonic scheme. But that, that system comes up in disguise after disguise, and it, it can always be modernized. Like, you know, you can go Vishnu, Brahma, Shiva, you can go God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, uh, intellect, irascibility, concupiscence, super ego, ego, id, and so on. It just keeps shape-shifting, but always, always that same thing. In fact, nobody's come along with any kind of faculty psychology to to supplant it or, or adequately criticize it even. So when you start applying it in a modern setting, with, with the modern ideas, taking Schopenhauer as your basis of will, and, and so on and so forth. You get a different kind of thing. And so what I, what I wanted to do in Grendel was specifically psychological. That is, uh, I didn't want to go through the details of how a guy, you know, gets his breakfast and gets his lunch and goes to work and all, all the realistic kind of business. Um, the kind of thing that makes a man nihilistic in real life takes you 200 pages to write, you know. 
But in a fable, you can say, one day Grendel met a dragon, and the dragon said, Stupid, 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 he hissed. The whole damn kitten caboodle. Why did you come here? Why do you bother me? Don't answer, he added quickly, stopping me. I know what's in your mind. I know everything. That's what makes me so sick and old and tired. I'm sorry, I said. Be still, he screamed. Flame shot clear to the cave mouth. I know you're sorry, for right now, that is, for this one frail, foolish flicker flash in the long, dull fall to eternity. I am unimpressed. No, no, be still. His eye burst open like a hole to hush me. I closed my mouth. The eye was terrible, lowering toward me. I felt as if I were tumbling down into it, dropping endlessly down through a soundless void. He let me fall down and down toward a black sun and spiders, though he knew I was beginning to die. Nothing could have been more disinterested. Serpent to the core. Poor Grendel. He used to be a teacher of ceramic sculpture here, and one of his students was a uh, very good salt glazed potter. So I asked him to make me a little dragon. And, uh, he got carried away. It's a sad thing, you know, that you can't see the face because it's terrifying. That's the best thing about it, and that's typical of him, too. It's sort of, you know, a Chinese trick of do your best thing only for the gods. <laughs> Characters in my books frequently spout philosophy, but it's always mock philosophy. <laughs> really, the best of, of example of that is in The Resurrection, where uh, I, wanted to, I, had, I wanted this guy to be a Collingwoodian philosopher who, on a basis of Collingwoodian philosophy, could see the error, a really fundamental error in Kant, on aesthetics, and I, I was very proud that I saw it, and I'm absolutely sure I was right, and I kept being tempted to write a philosophical essay to show, hey, John Gardner is a philosopher, right? But uh, if you're writing a novel, you can't write philosophy, at least not if the novel doesn't let you. If my stuff is bleak, the one thing that, that resists bleakness kind of is that um, people do love each other. Like, the Sunlight Man doesn't love anybody very much, but Clumley does. And uh, just because he's stupid doesn't really matter. Actually, love tells him his empathy with people, his, his ability to look at the other side, his desperate wish to be just in a world with, in which justice is impossible, or, as I say in some story, just ice. Um, that, that love thing is central to everything. Like in Wreckage of Agathon, what, what it really is supposed to come to is that Peeker at the end of the, you know, the, the disciple at the end of the novel does know about love. And, uh, and does pull all the other things together. In another mood, I do things like Jason Medea, where love is conspicuous by its absence, and finally, the world is so bad that you, you can only, you know, fight back with love. Ultimately, that's, of course, the, the old Presbyterian in me, and that's all that's left of it, you know, the Christian. It's the grace doctrine, that is to say, you don't win by your own efforts, and, and in the world that I understand, that is to say, this, this world we're in, this terminal world, Finally, love happens to you, you know, and uh, it even happens to Grendel. You know. uh, Grendel resisted desperately from beginning to end, but well, when he says, poor Grendel's had an accident, so may you all, it seems to me that that's a blessing as well as a curse. Down in southern Illinois, whatever can make it through the ravages of spring to the time when the heavy wet heat moves in, crowding every meadow and marsh with green, the time when the rattlesnakes come out on the rocks and dry brown creeks to sun themselves, coil on coil, their hatchet heads lifted to watch you pass, the deadly hot summer when farmers get up before dawn to hold bottomlands and work there only till the dew's off the ground, then quit, which happens when the sun's shoulder high. In summer, I was saying, the wind. Let me see. We stood there in the road, watching, and it seems I fell into a momentary trance. The storm came plunging northward toward us, and it never even crossed my mind that I ought to seek shelter. Grass, birds, underbrush creatures around us were hushed and motionless, hugging the ground, waiting as they do when an eagle's been sighted. And then 
not one at a time, but simultaneously, like angels arriving out of nowhere in a vision, three enormous black cyclones appeared, maybe 20 miles away, and they came along, crazily swaying like wild black savages, dancing with a sigh that passed. The world came awake, whispering alarm at the first little puff of wind, and old Shakespeare bolted. Thunder crashed above us, rain slammed down, bringing sticks and leaves. Then ahead of us, there was a widening patch of sea-green sky full of lightning flashes. The world was howling, everything was churning, writhing, screaming, obscured to the vagueness of things seen underwater, things wrapped in fire, by the plunging of blood-dark rain. At the center of the patch of unnatural light stood the house we'd all of us heard of, and some, as I've said, had reportedly seen. Smaller, humbler than I would have expected. No work of evil man or devils is finally impressive compared to the vastness of the universe or the hopeful imagination. And yet it was a fine old house from southern Illinois, tall and morose with heaven knows how many rooms and a soaring blunt tower that swayed like something alive in that violent wind. There were no lights, no sign of habitation. It's, it's, you have any experiences at all in the world and, and you lose all faith in everything, I think. The only faith you can never lose is in love because, because you still love people and they still love you and you can't believe it. You know? and, and I do such bad things and I, I say, oh, that's it. <laughs> you know, I cancel this last 40 years and then my wife holds me and she knows, you know. You poor, dumb, stupid, you're miserable again, but it's all right. And then it is all right. I do identify with the monster, obviously. Yeah, but that's, that's the neat thing about it. I know from the beginning that the monster's wrong, and I know precisely why the monster's wrong. And I also am very tempted to, to look at the world in the way Grendel does. That is to say, with no faith, you know? Uh, that's, uh, Grendel's a lovely animal because he's, he really is like all of us. Every one of us knows that the sun's going to come up tomorrow and that even though the world may be meaningless, we can make a meaning little by little. And, and um, yeah, like when in Resurrection, I was trying to do this thing where there's a man who really does know the answers and uh, make him a lovable man and, and set up a model for people, and myself included. But uh, it works a lot better when you, when you take characters who don't know the answers. And then, of course, the more complicated their errors are, and the more neatly their errors sort of mesh, the better. So that, you know, when you get to something like Jason Medea, it really is fun because Jason is absolutely wrong. He thinks you can do everything with you know, wheeler dealer stuff and intellect and all that. Medea is absolutely wrong. She thinks passion is enough. All promises are kept and all this kind of thing. And without each other, of course, they're terrible with each other. They kill each other, which is probably true of a lot of marriages and relationships. But it, it's fun. I really liked it. In a distant time, I saw these things, and in all our times, when angry Medea was still on Earth, and the mind of Jason struggled to undo disaster, defiant of destiny, crushed. I saw these things in a world of old graves where wine cups waited, and King Dionysus Christ refused to die, though forgotten, drinking and dancing toward birth. And Artemis, with empty eyes, sang life's final despair, proud scorn of hope in a room gone strange, decaying, a sleeping planet adrift and drugged, while deep in the night, old snakes were coupling with murderous intent. I have no discipline at all. I write the way heroin addicts take fixes, you know, whenever possible, I write. If somebody really forces me to do something else, like, um, like prepare a class or, or wash dishes or whatever, then I stop writing. And, and then there are things that I like to do, like mow the lawn, fool with the horses, and things like that. But except for other completely undisciplined activities, all I do is write. Go ahead. I just head out in the woods, day after day after day after day after day. I spend about three years walking 
And I tell myself the story over and over until I never, I know every dark corner of that story. I know those people, I know, it's as if it were real. I just do it over and over and over and over. And when, when suddenly there comes a moment of joy, like, 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 like when the sun comes through, you know, you suddenly now I've got it. And then you start doing it on paper. I start doing it on paper. And then you find out that on paper it's slightly different and you have to change it and so on. But, but, but all the work is that walking. You know, it's, or, or riding horses, whatever. But, but just going off by yourself and, and moving, moving hard and fast. And, and sometimes slowly <laughs> depends on the part of the story you're in, you know. I'll tell you why I like to live here. I think what writers are supposed to do is, like everybody says, tell the truth. But tell the truth in a very special sense. Um, like there are politicians to tell you what's good and what's bad in slogans, and there are religious people, and there are teachers, and all those people. And the only people who tell you how complicated it is, and how you can never make up your mind, and how no decisions are possible because all sides have some truth in them, and so on, are writers because they don't have anything to win. They're just, just entertainers. You read a book because you got nothing to do, and you feel like reading a book. The result is that writers can tell the truth that everybody knows all the time, but nobody can afford to know. And when you live in New York City, or when you live in San Francisco, it becomes very important to always be saying the things that are important at the moment, things that the society needs to hear, not a hundred years from now, but right now. When you live here, you live around people who don't know the complications. They got their simple prejudices, and, and their simple loves, and, and hates, and you're in touch with creatures and animals and, and hills and all that kind of stuff. And so you lose the ability to be complicated in a sophisticated way. You lose the ability to uh, to take shortcuts and all that kind of stuff. You have all the time in the world because in a place like this, like I grew up in, in Western New York, which was like this then, but now it's complicated and, and all that. And what I do is so complicated, I have no room for a complicated life. I have to have all my time to, to work at books and, and um, typewriter. And it's pretty easy to run a house around here so that Joan can compose and the kids can be kids and I can be a writer. We don't want your weevil weed and we don't want your barley. You can take your weevil weed across the river to Charlie. That's the time I had with that bonsai. <laughs> 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 you know how to do it. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. 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 yeah, the last couple of years, you know, when everybody, anybody asked me what I did at parties, I'd say I drew bonsai. And I didn't know what a bonsai was. So we're coming back from Greece, and Helen sees, Helen Bridget sees this bonsai tree in the airplane catalog, so she orders me this bonsai tree. $55 for a 52 year old tree. We murdered it, according to the instructions. Right, right, right. How to deal with the bonsai tree, and Helen says, aha, you've been telling people for years you grow bonsai trees, and, and now you do it. Joan can lean against an oak tree and it dies, right? And so she gives her a bonsai tree. Oh, 54 years for nothing. <laughs> right. So I scrape off all, and it never tells about it. It tells about how to build the perfect environment for this bonsai tree. It should be built out of, you know, seven sticks on the left, five on the right, and all this. The are all in that Japanese English, you know. Taking your bonsai tree, please. Yeah. It must be. <laughs> So I take it much needs outdoors there. I put it in sun, I put it in uh, rain, I put it in tree, I put it and it still looks uh, very sad. So next comes in the mail from the same company. A little catalog of plastic bonsai trees. And they have flowers on them and stuff. And so I think everybody wants plastic ones, they know real ones die. Plastic ones last forever. Okay, this year, so I'm going to buy one that looks just like this. So I take a Polaroid picture of this before it's completely dead. I send it to to Ken and Luz in uh, Southport, Connecticut. She's telling the truth. She's telling the truth in her way. Right, yes. Don't put me on that tree in plastic because she won't know. Right. So when it dies, right? Can it revive itself?
Yeah, yeah, he said it lion's it's blood, right. It's the 54 oh, years old in one oh. There's this platonic idea of a short story, you know. A short story should be terse, right? No extra words, right? If, if you say that, then you take any given short story, for instance, uh, take a Henry James story, you know, you immediately start rewriting the story, and you're going to turn it into uh, a Gene Stafford story, you know? Or you take a Faulkner story, and you're going to turn it into a Gene Stafford story, and everything is going to come down to, finally, no matter what the guy writes, you're going to revise it for, for brevity, you know, for, for quick, punchy, you know, all that stuff. And it's always going to be Gene Stafford. And, like, uh, Gene Stafford was nice, but she is not the platonic idea. There is no platonic idea. Ultimately, a guy's got to do it his own way. And, and so the kind of teaching that I, I really respect is teaching that tries to see what that kid is doing, you know, and, and then tries to help him do it better his way, even if you hate it, you know? I went to Iowa because Iowa is where all the writers go. I was writing something that was rather different from what other people at the workshop were writing. And at that time, it was, of course, a lot worse than what the people in the workshop were writing. But I didn't like what they wrote. And when I got good, I didn't want to be like them when they got good. And so I sort of wrote privately and um, took medieval courses. And then at the last minute, some very kind professors let me do a creative quotes, PhD, that is to say a novel. And I had been taking workshops all along. I had a very nice deal with the workshop there. They were very good teachers all that time. In fact, some of the very best writers in America. Uh, Saul Bellow was there, and Herb Gold, and Robert O. Bowen, Margaret Young, I spent some time with. Vance Bouchely, et cetera. And um, I would write and turn in my stories into their mailboxes and not go to any classes. And, at the end of the quarter, get back the stories with the A's on them and no comments. And that was very nice. I didn't want any comments because um, some writers really want to learn how to write correctly, you know. What that really means is that they write exactly like everybody else. And uh, there's another kind of writer who may be worse sometimes is uh, who is absolutely stubborn about what he's going to do. Joan drives slowly, as she always does after those drunken parties, clinging to the wheel with both small blue-white hands, her jaw thrown forward. Her beauty in the darkness makes me faint, white cheekbones high as an Indian's, red copper hair, gray eyes. An apparition, an apprehension of weirdly lighted crypts in a mist-tongue grove. I stare through the windshield, through my clownish reflection, and though I've forgotten my behavior already, I am full of wrath, remorse. Ah, how I've made that poor girl suffer. Whoa, whoa. My reflected mouth twists. Then I smile. So does it. Gloomier than ever. And pull down the brim of my old black hat till it meets with the collar of my overcoat. She'll forgive me. Poor Joan understands my plight and hers, the plight of the universe. Lightless, mere shell of its former self. We've survived a good many trials together, my Joan and I. Poor suffering artists, a composer, a poet. The years have made us like a couple of sly old outlaws, shriveled and testy, holed up in a cave. We dress in black. The car lights myopically grope down the road past old drunken telephone poles, dead barns. Then we're home, the house and chicken house stark as tombstones under the zombie glow of the security light. She parks the car, hangs it up by one fender on the sagging fence, comes around to my side and helps me out, and we lean on each other across the lawn to the steps and up into the bone white house. Empty, too big for us two tonight, the children sleeping with friends in town. I suffer a black premonition of sad old age. Two husks in the doorway, pictures of children, grandchildren. I play with the idea, walking stooped now, tasting my lips in search of teeth. I believe I'll go sit in my chair, <laughs> good old chair, I say to my love, old joy of my life, and wring my fingers. Come to bed, she says. I give her a look. There's a time I'd have knocked her on her ear, but we've grown old. I obey. 
She pauses at the top of the stairs to catch her breath, one hand on the newel post, the other on her heart. Tick, tick. Ah, whoa. She was beautiful once. I watch her looking at the painting of our daughter. She glances back at me, a thought in her mind. She, too, our Lucy, will grow womanly, beautiful, but time will blast her. Her flesh will sag like an elderly dog's. They, too, have their flicker, their hour as art, like Snow White's stepmother, Cleopatra, Eve. She looks down, silent, a kind of snag in time. At last, we continue on our arduous way, come huffing and blowing to our room, cracked plaster, and fumbling, helping each other as we must. We get ready for bed, take our teeth out. I am 92. The planet is dying, pestilence, famine, everlasting war, the nation's in the hands of child molesters. She says in the darkness, I miss John Knapper. I grunt, swimming back, unwinding time, and I smile, Foxy. I pat her hand. I have half a mind to get up and write letters, give all my enemies heart attacks. I am sober, as still as midnight, full of joy. It's true that in my books, monsters are always important. People are monsters. People are called monsters by other characters and so on. Really, there are three kinds of things that are important in my things, I think. One is monsters, another is clowns, another is human beings. And of course, they keep shape-shifting. One turns into the other, or clowns are always trying to be human beings. What I mean by clowns is this. Human beings do things, and clowns desperately try to imitate human beings. So the acrobat gets up on the wire, and then the clown wants to be an acrobat, and he tries. But he's a straw man, and he can't be. He's always acting. He's always pretending. He's always faking, mimicking. Many of us feel that about ourselves all the time. That is to say, we put on masks and never find out who we really are. And one of the things that happens in a novel is characters who start out as clowns try to earn the grade as human beings. And sometimes they turn into monsters and said, monsters are those things that I used to go to the Saturday afternoon movies and see. I mean by monsters, walking dead. I mean nihilists, people who really have given up on all faith and so on, and act as if the world were evil and as if all people were either stupid or malicious. They're, they're creatures who have given in to the emotional war that's in everybody. Sometimes I use, for instance, in uh, Henry Soames and Nicolman, a monstrous kind of body, which contains monstrous emotions, but he's holding it in. And the thing, thing, of course, finally, is that he really is a monster, and he's holding it in, and that makes him human. That constantly he does what he knows is right, whatever the power of his emotions. So, your monsters are everywhere. 